Hi, I'm Lee Davis, attorney and owner of Lee Davis Law LLC here in Atlanta, Georgia, and this is The Legalist. If you've seen any of our past episodes, you know that most of them are very well produced by my agency, Agency 850, who produces these videos for me. But for the last several months, of course, we've all been quarantined under the COVID-19 crisis. And therefore, this is another rather informal uh, edition of our show today. And I've got a special guest with me today. Adian Miller is another attorney here in the Atlanta uh, area. And I'm going to let her tell you about her practice areas and a little bit about herself. Adian? Uh, my name is Adian Miller. I'm an employment attorney. I practice here in Atlanta. I'm at the law firm of Barrett and Farahani. Uh, we handle cases on behalf of employees who find themselves uh, victims of discrimination or retaliation or harassment, hostile work environment uh, in the workplace. Um, and so I have been doing that particular area of law for several years now. I've been a labor and employment attorney for about 11 years now. And I've been in the Atlanta area for about five, uh, and it felt like home the moment I got here. So I don't see myself going anywhere anytime soon. Excellent. Well, I know that you and I have uh, talked about some of the uh, current events that have uh, kind of been going on around us, not just with COVID-19, but uh, also with a lot of the uh, social unrest and uh, some of the uh, issues in our society, uh, cultural issues that are really um, boiling over at times uh, today, and I know that that's kind of right in your wheelhouse, so I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about a few topics, and I know the people that uh, watch this video are going to be uh, be interested as well. So um, I wanted to go ahead and uh, hit the first topic because I think it's, uh, well, most topical, <laughs> and uh, that is, um, can you tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are uh, with return to work and issues that uh, maybe employees that are returning to work after being uh, at, under stay-at-home orders, uh, what are their rights and uh, what are the things that they can do if they're concerned about their health going back to uh, the workplace? Well, we are sort of an uncharted territory here. Um, we really haven't had a pandemic like this, at least in the decade or so I've been practicing. Um, and so some of this is really just using our um, best wisdom. Uh, but we do have some rights under law. And so uh, one thing to keep in mind is, you know, we're in Georgia, which is very much, it's a right to work pro-employer state. And so employees should be very careful uh, to do as much as they can to keep themselves safe. Uh, my first inquiry to anybody who feels that they are working in a place that's not safe due to COVID is to ask themselves if they really need that job. And I do think it's very serious. I want to validate people's concerns. Um, I think a lot of companies uh, might be in a place where they're doing the best they can, but I don't think we should be lulled into a false sense of safety by the fact that some of these companies are reopening. And so it is incumbent on each person to really make sure that they need that job and that they are taking care of themselves because it is possibly their life that they're taking into their hands. Um, so if you're going to a job and you know you need it and you feel like there might be some things that are unsafe, the first thing to do is really to figure out what it is that feels unsafe and why. You know, is it that you are handling papers that a lot of people are putting their hands on? You know, what are the exact responsibilities of your job that put you at risk? And how, how do they put you at risk? And be able to articulate that. You don't want to just go to your employer with a general vague sense of do it. Um, and the other thing you want to look at is, you know, you want to think practically, is there a way to do my job safer? What would make me feel safe? Now, some folks might have underlying health issues, such as, like, I have asthma. Um, and so I am working remotely until the end of the year. <laughs> I'm just going to be as careful as possible. Um, so if you have an underlying health issue, it might be that you need something specific for you. Uh, and in that case, you actually have the protections of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So what you can do is go to your employer and say, this is my health condition. It makes me feel like I am more vulnerable because these are the job duties I'm doing that are exposing me to COVID or I feel safe, unsafe about. And the way to do it safer to me would be X, Y, and Z. Um, and I would recommend to any employee who does that to do it in writing. And you want to do it to HR. 
Uh, and so you can just send an email. You don't need to have a lawyer. You don't need to have anyone come in. Um, if you want to use the term that you'd like to be reasonably accommodated, that will signal to the employer that you know some of your rights. But what you're asking for basically is a reasonable accommodation. Um, the employer should work with you and have a dialogue with you about how to accommodate you. Uh, and if you find that instead of responding to you, you're terminated, you may be able to pursue a claim of retaliation under the American Disabilities Act. Now, if you don't have a disability, you still have some other options. Um, one thing you can do is if you and a group of employees feel unsafe, you can go and talk to your employer about those concerns. And it may be seen as concerted activity under the National Labor Relations Act. And so under the NLRA, uh, employees have a right to talk to each other and make complaints as a group to try to improve their work conditions. Uh, if you go that route, I would just advise people to set up a meeting with HR uh, or their supervisor, but then to document the meeting afterwards in an email or uh, to send an agenda beforehand. You want something in writing kind of documenting what happened. And is that, is that just for people that are part of labor unions or can anybody uh, do that? Anybody can do that. You just want to make sure you're talking to other employees that are at your rank. So it should be a group of you going to management. Um, so you don't have to be in a union to have that right. Um, and that's important because very few employees in Georgia are actually in unions. Uh, it's not a very union heavy state. If you find that the employer does not want to engage with you, uh, another option is you can go to OSHA. So OSHA is accepting complaints. And I will say, I think it's a good option for people. You can go to OSHA.gov. They make it very easy to file a complaint. The thing I would recommend is you can make a complaint about what's unsafe, but again, this is where it comes back to you need to be very specific about what's unsafe. Um, you would file that complaint and you have an option to remain anonymous, which I think a lot of people would do on instinct and I'd like to caution against that. I think you want to put your name on it uh, because then if you do find that you're terminated or demoted or reduced in hours, you would have a, a right to retaliation claim under OSHA as well. The big concern here, and the reason why people don't use this very much, is you only have 30 days to file a retaliation complaint under OSHA. It's one of the fastest statutes out there. So you got to be real quick on that. Um, and all the things I'm talking about are things that you don't need a lawyer for. I recommend, you know, getting a lawyer if you're looking at proceeding with a lawsuit. But these are initial complaints going to the EEOC, going to the NLRA, going to OSHA. They all have web platforms that are very friendly to people who may not have legal training. They all have numbers with people you can talk to. So the first thing you want to do is protect your rights. And then you want to try and talk to a lawyer if it looks like you're going to need to go down that route. Aidy, and that is some really good information. And I know uh, our listeners and our watchers are going to enjoy that. Um, but I have a, a similar question, I guess, that kind of dovetails with that issue, which is I've seen a little bit of uptick in uh, maybe questionable layoffs uh, that are kind of being camouflaged by larger layoffs due to COVID-19. I was wondering if you've seen any of that, and if so, uh, what do you think about that? Definitely seen it. Um, because Georgia is a very pro-employer state, the case law is very much in favor of companies being able to run their businesses the way they want. We've always seen that a reduction in force or a business reorganization tend to be opportunities for employers to get rid of employees who might be older or more vulnerable and have disabilities, and they can pretty much do it under this cover because they're letting go of a lot of people. Um, so it definitely happens, and COVID is just another, it's, an, it's a national pandemic. So from an employer perspective, it's a great opportunity to trim the ranks. Um, and it's tough. And the fact that they're doing it as part of a larger uh, layoff, does that make it any less um, or does it make it any more legal that they're doing it uh, in the guise of a larger layoff? It doesn't make it more legal. It just makes it hard to prove the illegality. And the burden's always been high for an employee to show it was illegal. What you want to look for and what really kind of tips the hand as, as to it being an illegal layoff or reduction is you know, did they actually keep your position open and fill it with somebody not of your protected class? So if you're a black employee, did they actually keep that position and fill it with a white employee or a younger employee? Um, if you see that happening, then you probably would have a good chance of proving it. 
uh, and again, I mean, it's hard to speak to actual chances, but you would actually have something to sort of hang your hat on and to say, well, wait a second, like why, if, if it's really part of COVID, why did you keep that position funded? Why is somebody in there now who's not of my protected categories? And what is the first step in, in some type of uh, review of that? Is it the EEOC? Is that your first uh, step in something like that? Yes, every employee is required to file a complaint. It's called a charge with the EEOC. And you can go to the EEOC.gov to do that. It needs to be in Georgia. It's 180 days from the event that you think uh, was discriminatory. So that's a little bit longer, but you know, the sooner you do it, the, the, the better it works out for everybody. But you can go to them and the EEOC will investigate and request information and documents from the employer. That's also a point where you can talk to some attorneys and see if they also think that there's enough evidence for a case. Okay, great, excellent. Thank you. Um, now, the third topic that I wanted to talk uh, with you about today is um, something that has really been resonating with me lately, um, and that is the friction uh, between different cultural groups uh, within our society. Um, I am very much, I try to be very much a uh, live and let live uh, type of, of person, and I try not to get too worked up about every single thing that I see that is in society that is wrong, but sometimes I just can't do that. Sometimes it just bubbles over and I have to do something, I have to act. And this is one of those areas I feel like I am not going to be able to be silent and I am not going to be able to sit by and do nothing. So uh, what I am really curious about are your thoughts about what we really as attorneys and uh, leaders in the community, what can we do to help uh, with uh, some of these uh, cultural uh, uh, differences uh, that, that seem to be bubbling over right now. I agree with you. I think now is an important time for people to speak, and I want to encourage people to speak. Um, I think we need to be mindful of the fact that people, again, you know, in Georgia, we do not have as many rights as some other states, and so you do need to be cautious uh, if you want to keep your job. And so to that extent, I want to inform people as to the best ways to share those opinions and to have that dialogue in a way that's going to protect them. Um, I like to encourage people, I'm always a big proponent of putting things in writing, uh, in, and I find email is a fantastic avenue for that. Um, but I also like to encourage people to speak to each other. Again, we're talking about the NLRA. You can talk to your other employees about ways that maybe uh, you would like to see more diversity in your workplace. You would like the workplace conditions to improve. Discrimination you might be seeing. Um, if you have that conversation with your colleagues, um, that technically can be protected. If you want to make a complaint in the workplace and, and, and really start up the discussion, um, I always recommend you want to do it in writing to HR or supervisory employees so that you're protected under Title VII of uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, I had a friend, uh, her company does a town hall every so often where you can talk to the CEO. And one of the employees started uh, putting forth a lot of her frustration about the company's lack of diversity and that their values didn't reflect their workplace. And I, I think that's fantastic. I think it's amazing. And I'm always so impressed by people who have the integrity and the courage to speak up. But I want to see her follow up that phone call with an email <laughs> in writing to HR um, so that if anything happens to her, she can claim, she can seek the protections of the anti-retaliatory provisions of uh, Title VII. And emails, uh, you say emails and in writing because um, that's, of course, a nice form of evidence in case you ever need it to prove that something actually did happen and that there is. I can't no even tell you the number of clients I have who tell me I went to HR to complain about this and they terminated me the next day and HR says, oh no, he's coming in to talk to me about, you know, the vending machines. I mean, they'll just, <laughs> you know, there's no evidence. So yes, yeah, you want it documented in some way, but that's what you want to talk about. All right, excellent. Well, Adian, this has been a great eye-opening uh, episode, and I really do appreciate you uh, you coming on. Can you uh, tell our viewers, um, like, if they wanted to reach out with you, they had an issue, uh, if they wanted to reach out with you, how to reach you, and, and that sort of Absolutely. thing? Absolutely. I, I think the best way is to go to our website. It's justiceatwork.com. We have two, we have a couple options. Um, there is a chat will, that will pop up. You can talk to somebody. You can schedule a phone call. There's a number you can call directly. 
every case that comes to us we, uh, is screened by an actual attorney and you will get to talk to an attorney. And then if it looks like there might be something there for that we can pursue, you'll actually get another uh, sit down with another attorney. So you, you, you get a fair amount of attention so we can make sure we're doing everything we can to help. Excellent. Well, that's about all we have for today. Um, if you want to reach me, if you want to give some feedback, if you like this episode, if you like the information, uh, please hit the like button below, hit the subscribe button. I always like to have subscribers. And if you want to reach me, you can reach me anywhere on social media. Just look for Lee Davis Law, and uh, that'll be me. Or you can go to my website, which is a differentlawfirm.com. And I look at that, and I receive uh, inquiries all the time. Um, you're talking to the man. So uh, go ahead and reach out to me. And until next time, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.